This is pretty much pop, a culture podcast instantly made obsolete by the widespread use of electricity. Today we're talking about the TV show Downton Abbey that started in 2010, in light of the new film Downton Abbey, A New Era. I'm Mark Lichtenmeyer, simply scandalized by all this irregularity. Hi folks, John Lamoureux with The Hustle Podcast. I think this is my third time back. And the first one not talking about music. So hey. That's true. This is kind of, I'm stretching my wings here a little bit. Hi, I'm Corinne McLeod, and Mark and I go way back. I'm a former television news reporter and anchor. Right now, I'm semi-retired, but a huge Downton Abbey fan and really excited to be here. And I'm Michael McLeod, Corinne's husband, and I'm a huge Downton Abbey fan. Professionally, I'm a photographer, but oh my gosh, this movie was amazing. So thank you, Michael, for jumping in literally 20 minutes before we did this. Another panelist has COVID, was coughing too much to appear on this. So I'm actually kind of glad to have a couple because this has been sort of a couple's thing in my house. John, what is your, is this a couple's thing or is this a solo activity? No, I'm not going to watch <laughs> Down Abbey by myself. That would be weird. No, this is very much a couple's thing. My wife and I have been watching it since the beginning. We were turned on by friends and have stuck with it. She has not seen the recent movie I have. Interesting that a guy who refuses to watch the show by himself has apparently seen the movie without his wife. I was visiting my mom and my uh, mom wanted to see it. And I thought that was a great idea. A great thing for me and my mom to do together. It's very generational. We did try to get my daughter into it after we had seen a lot of it. And she was in late high school at the time. And eh, there's too much other things. <laughs> Whereas Bridgerton, she loves. So maybe this is not salacious enough for the youth audience, but it sure works for the 80 plus year olds. Hey, now. I've never seen Bridgerton. Seems a little too scandalous for me, but I'm down with Downton Abbey. So, Michael, start us. What is so magical? How is this just not another of the many historical dramas? Oh, where to begin? To be honest, it was Corinne's idea to begin watching Downton Abbey. When was it? Like 2015, I think we started? I think we joined it after the third season. We might have... I think they were about to start the fourth season or they were starting the fourth season. So we had to catch up a couple of seasons. Had heard about it from some friends. I was very reluctant to join. I thought, oh no, this is going to be one of those dramas that it's just, it's going to be boring. And I was hooked first episode. I loved it. The cast, they're just magic. They work together so well. You can just feel that energy. So Julian Fellows really brought something, brought something new, I think, to that drama. I think the setting of High Clear Castle, it's just such an amazing space. And to be able to appreciate how much the family has maintained the castle and really been almost one of the stars of the show in its own right, the setting. I know there are lots of period dramas out there, but I think as Michael said, Julian Fellows, the the writer just really nailed it, knocked it out of the park. On Absolutely. This it just draws you in and it, it kind of hooks you with all the different storylines. A good way for me to see like what, how you are attached to this show. So the Gilded Age is the new show. For me, it is basically the same show. Like, I don't care that it doesn't have all the same characters. In fact, I'm kind of sick of those old characters. So it's just sheerly the style. And I don't know, there's something weird about getting attached to people reacting in a conservative way to (laughs) changing times and being flustered about things that we would not be flustered about, right? Uptight people, I guess, is what it comes down to. This is... Common to lots of historical dramas, of course, people worrying too much about who they're going to marry and whether they're marryable and all these kind of things. But some of those things test my patience. This one, it works okay. I don't know. Are there things that significantly irritate you about some of these plot tropes here? In, I think in some ways for me, Gilded Age, the characters don't seem to be perhaps as rounded as the ones on Downton. I felt from the very first episode of the series of Downton Abbey, they really, in a a nutshell, very concisely and precisely outlined who each person was. You knew immediately where Lord Grantham stood on things. You knew immediately what Mary was all about. And old lady Grantham, I mean, Maggie Smith can do no wrong in my eyes anyway, but you knew immediately about her character. And in the Gilded Age, I felt like it took a bit more time to kind of get things rolling to kind of establish some characters. And I didn't perhaps fall in love with them as immediately as I did in Downton. Michael, what did you think? I agree. I think that Gilded just took some time to get going, but I'm hooked. 
<laughs> we were we're looking forward to, to episode or to season two rather. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. But yeah, the, the characters from Downton definitely you knew who they were instantly. It was Julian Fellows did an amazing job with defining each character with the Gilded. It's taking some time to get to know some characters, which is also a good thing. I think it leaves room for for more episodes. That's true. What did you think, Mark? Yes, you're right. Gilded Age is less of an ensemble thing, which is strange given what a big ensemble it has. But there are all those servant characters that so many of them are super strong actors that you've seen in other things. Like, why is this person in there to deliver two lines? Well, because they'll get around to them, is my theory. This is at least my criticism of the movies of Downton Abbey, is that the casts are too big to make an effective. Like, it's fine if you're going back and forth between several plots over a season and then the next season we can focus more on somebody else. But, you know, I felt like at the end of this new film, like they're all just lining up for a group picture. Don't you like these characters? Aren't we feeding you what you came here for? Even though some of them just have gotten a dab of attention. And it's also like their lives were completely on hold since the last movie (laughs) that we've established a romance, but don't worry. It didn't move anywhere while you weren't looking. If I could interject here, because we've talked on two different topics here that I have strong feelings about. Number one is you were mentioning earlier, the attraction to period pieces, Mark. And I was thinking about, for whatever reason, it just, for a lot of people, not for everybody, but for a certain type of person that appreciates a certain type of culture or story, watching conservative British people deal with social mores and advancing or progressive social mores is always going to be interesting, but it's not the mores themselves. It's the reaction of the characters. And that comes down to the writing. And I think that's what Michael was kind of talking about earlier. Julian Fellows has managed to make it interesting to watch these particular people, namely Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith is going to have some kind of funny quip or Michelle Dockery is going to look really pretty and say something kind of biting or Elizabeth McGovern is going to seem very distant from it all because she's also American and has a kind of a different perspective. And Hugh Bonneville is going to react one way because he's old British money, so to speak, or patriarchy in a way that's trying to deal with these new changes into his way of life. Some people pull this off really, really well. I think we would agree that something like, for instance, I was thinking, getting ready to talk to you, I recently watched the British miniseries of Howard's End, and it was okay. It didn't knock me out or anything. The movie Howard's End from 30 years ago was gorgeous. So it's not that everybody dealing with these mores is interesting. It's these particular characters dealing with it, using these words and language to describe it that is interesting. Having said that, you talk about too many characters, and that's absolutely true. That was one of my issues with Downton as it went along. I mean, let's be honest here. It eventually became more of a soap opera and incorporated more people than I could keep straight. I still to this day don't know what everyone's title is. I remember the actor and actress's names more than I do the characters' names. One thing I think about a lot is, I think it was the first season or the second one when Brendan Coyle and Joanne Froggett, and I can't remember their names in the show, it was kind of a will they or won't they. And they were the engines to me that drove those first season or two. You love them so much and you wanted to see these two servants basically come together and find each other and be in love and have a happy life together. And then there was a season or two of just manufactured drama that went on around. It was like they wouldn't let these two people be together. And then they went away. We invested so heavily in these two characters and their get together and their love life. And then they were down. Then they had a couple of seasons of drama and then nothing forever, including the movies. It's weird to me who they decide to kind of rise to the top, whose storylines get to be featured and whose don't, when they do, when they don't. They could trim the fat on probably half the cast and just focus on the few that still have something really interesting to say. They could kill them off like they do everyone else who wants to leave the show, apparently. I will say that I thought that the second film, the one that is out right now, carried off the larger cast better than the first film. And feel free to disagree with me. if No, I would agree with you on that. Yeah, it it seems like the two locations allowed for more storylines, as Mark was mentioning about interweaving the storylines better. The first one I felt was very pat very kind of manufactured. It was wonderful to see all the characters back because it had been several years since the series had ended. But I felt like this new movie, the new era, did that much better. And it wasn't quite so manufactured as I felt the first one was. 
I have to be honest. I can't remember what the first movie was about. I was trying to remember getting ready to talk to you, and I don't remember what the plot of that movie was. Yeah, I just had to read it on Wikipedia because it was yeah. that was how forgettable I feel like yeah. it was. I mean, it was great. If you're a fan, it's like watching an extended episode, you know, but I don't remember whatever drama was involved in that episode. It didn't stick with me because I couldn't tell the you. The queen what came to visit. Oh, is that what it was? Yep, pretty oh. much. The king okay. and queen and getting the house ready. and Yeah, there's some high I- drama for you. But that's what lovers of Downton Abbey get excited about, you know? I think you guys are right about with this new era, having a couple different locations really helped Mm -hmm. to break it up a little bit and allow us to see a little bit more into each character's lives. I will say one thing about this movie. Julian Fellows, for whatever reason, keeps using Michelle Dockery, Lady Mary's love life as a well that he continues to return to. There was no reason for her to have it. So she was married to the Dan Stevens guy who got killed off because he wanted to leave the show. Hope this isn't a spoiler for anybody who was thinking of watching Downton Abbey 20 years afterwards or whatever it is. Then she marries another guy near the end of the series. And he's not in this show, but she goes to work in Hollywood, so to speak, on this movie. And then, of course, the director and her have to have chemistry. Everybody always has to have chemistry with Lady Mary. It's always got to be a will she or won't they will Lady Mary love this guy or leave her husband or have an affair or whatever? Is that because she's the hottest of the two daughters? I don't understand, but it just feels like we keep going back to this well rather than let's see Lady Mary domesticated. Let's see Lady Mary in a happy marriage. Let's see Lady Mary doing something that doesn't involve, is she going to have an affair with the guy who's sharing the screen with her? But that's where they keep going back to. It was my understanding that the reason that the husband that she married in season five, his filming schedule, the actor's filming schedule was so tight that they had to explain his absence for some reason, but I thought that was a bit contrived. Could have killed him off. (laughs) (laughs) He was a race car driver, wasn't he? That would be easy enough to do. But it's the actor, Matthew Good, I think, who is one of the cast members who has a career outside of Downton that's fairly steady. And that's something I was curious about too. It's been interesting to me to see what all the actors and actresses within the Downton universe have either gone on the do or not gone on the do. I think everyone would have probably pegged Michelle Dockery as a breakout star. And do they like it that way? Is it okay? Do they get to be on stage in London and that's where they want to be? Or did they think it would be the you know launch pad to something bigger? I don't know. I was surprised today in reading that one of Julian Fellow's influences was this was American TV shows like ER. And for a while after ER went off the air, because it was on so long and had such a big cast that I felt like there had to be a representative cast member of ER in every new show. Lost was the same way. Huge cast, very distinctive casting style. I know things are different in British land such that there's overlap in everything. Like you're going to find in every British thing you see like, oh, that person was on Doctor Who at some point. Like (laughs) there just seems like a small enough pool of actors, I guess. But yes, that is always fun to sort of see how this actor industry that you feel like (laughs) that a show has produced of what waves that creates in the world. Are there going to be 10 other Downton Abbey things? Are there shows that are like that featuring one of the characters? In this case, seemingly not. Whereas with Lost, it was like, how many more crazy shows can we have? And let's have the one person from here being our representative of the old guard. Well, I know that Julian Fellows likes to recycle actors and actresses. Didn't we think that in the Gilded Age that the butler was the king in the movie? I think that's right. Yeah. And I know he's worked with Elizabeth McGovern before. And I think Hugh Bonneville and and Elizabeth McGovern had played a married couple, perhaps in another one of Julian Fellows' works. I can't recall if he was the author, the writer of that or not. Yeah, I don't know if he was the writer or not, but I I believe they were together before. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise me if they, you know, somebody visiting the Gilded Age from Downton Abbey, that they're in universe because they're both, you know, historical fiction and there's at least nothing overtly contra, you know, there's nothing fantastical that would rule out. So it better not have a significant character that's an overlap. That would just ruin my ability to suspend disbelief. You want to keep them distinct things. I guess, unless it is intentional, unless it's an actual character crossover. I think, John, you were referring to just the stakes. Oh, we must make the house nice for the queen. Like that this is kind of a typical... I want to say low stakes, but then so much of the show is very high stakes in that if these people lose their job, they're destitute. Like they might as well just kill themselves because that's how messed up this society is. 
and how rigid. And if one of the nobles has a scandal, then they just might as well be shipped off to the third world. So is this more compelling, less compelling? I guess it has the advantage that it has drama that brings us in, but it, in some ways, it has enough removal from our own lives that it is not in any way distressing in the way that I just did a show on This Is Us. And there's so many things in that show that this is drama. Your parents are going to die. <laughs> like it seems one step removed here, even though, of course, we do have people getting illnesses and things like that. It's interesting you say this, Mark, because, and maybe the McLeods would disagree with me, but I don't feel like the loss of this lifestyle. I mean, it is interesting to watch this family deal with progressive culture, but I never felt like it all being on the verge of this lifestyle slipping through their fingers was necessarily a driving force of the show. That would have been more interesting to me. Actually, you describing it that way, I probably would have thought it was more interesting to watch a show about an aristocratic British family that is on the cusp of losing their castle and their noblehood and all this kind of stuff versus, you know, who's Lady Mary going to hook up with this season? That might have been more interesting to me. I don't know. I don't feel like that was ever the the overarching driving force of the show. It felt more kind of soap opera-y to me, but maybe the McLeods would disagree. Well, I think that that was a theme that they touched on in a couple of episodes. I mean, the whole reason, sure. you know, the Earl of Grantham married Cora in the first place was because he needed the American money. And then the Dan Stevens character, I believe his character was Matthew. You know, he inherited the money from his fiance's father and wanted to give it all away. But yet he comes finally in the end sailing into rescue Downton once again and become you know, the co-owner. But I agree with you that I think the economic struggle may have been an interesting point as, as a driver. I agree. It really was. There was always definitely a need for money in the show. It makes you think twice before wanting to own a castle. <laughs> <laughs> Leaky roof and all. Yeah. There's a lot going on and... It just really shows how they look at picking their spouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right, guys. I hadn't thought about those little details. So many of those details. I'm not smart enough to remember so many of those details. They go right over my head. I can't remember who's the Duchess or Duke of whatever and how everyone's related. I can't keep any of that stuff straight. In fact, do you, I was thinking, do you remember when Shirley MacLaine came into the picture for a season? Wasn't she Elizabeth McGovern's mom? Yes. And, but she was only in a couple of episodes and even a couple of scenes within those. You, it was a big deal. Shirley MacLaine joins Downton Abbey. And I don't think she, they didn't really do anything with her. Nothing of note, nothing major. And that seemed to happen a lot. I just, I don't know if they're missed opportunities. They're missed opportunities to me because I'm more interested in Brendan Coyle and Joanne Froggett than I am somebody else. Or let's introduce, you know, we need a younger woman. We've sort of dealt with the sisters enough. So we'll bring in a niece and, you know, have her be the focus for a while. And then she's just disappeared. Like she wasn't in this last movie at all. That's the Lily James character. Yes. I guess we're not supposed to care because she's probably busy too. She has other movies. She was in Pam and Tommy. Did you see that? <laughs> no, no. That show was great and she was great in it, but it's uh, not for everybody. It's pretty scandalous. Did they even mention her in this last movie? I don't movie? think so. I don't think so. I, I don't recall. What does that say in terms of what we're supposed to be paying attention to? That is this actually, despite the appearance of being a true ensemble piece, we're really going to focus on that core family. And yes, you can kill them off, but you can't just have them be forgotten. <laughs> or is it really that it is the house? It is the way of life. I feel like the point of view of the show is that this way of life of nobles and even the servants are on board. We must uphold the honor of this house. That that is very important to them. And I just find that a laughable goal. Like, no, turn it into a museum. This is not something I'm going to get on board with actually sympathizing with and fretting with them that, oh, they could be in disgrace. Well, well, I, I never missed Lily James, so I must be on that side. And that's not against her. I think she's a great actress and really cute. Hope she has a great career, but I wasn't longing for her in this movie or anything. And I think the point about the ensemble cast, I mean, even as the opening credits roll, it's all alphabetical order. It doesn't say, and Dame Maggie Smith or anything. There's no top billing of anything. It truly is an ensemble, you know, whether they're playing the kitchen maid or whether they're playing Lord Grantham, they're all just listed right, right in alphabetical order. Yeah, certainly there was an acknowledgement of the core cast this time and less of the, all the extras throughout the years, I think. I think it really, it kind of brought it home. 
in that way. Kind of narrowed the focus of it. it absolutely. Although is the core cast now include who is the maid that's sort of, you know, the kitchen scullion maid who got to you know have a happy ending in this one? Daisy. Daisy. Yes. I felt like she was sort of comic relief in the early stuff and like became a pretty significant central character. Maybe just because it's whoever's the most likable, you know, Mr. Mosley, another, you know, he was just a little thing to laugh at occasionally. And now he's like, gets significant screen time because he's just like him. I thought that was kind of satisfying for a lot of them. I mean, giving Mosley something to do, 15 minutes of screen time in a two hour, 10 minute movie that's satisfying. That's really what you want. And the cook, the older redhead lady, what's her? Patmore. Patmore, of course. And she now has kind of a boyfriend or something. And you're like, good for Mrs. Patmore. You know, she's a sweetheart. She got less than Mosley. She got maybe like eight minutes of screen time. But at the end of the movie, you're satisfied and happy that Pat Moore got a boyfriend. I think those are effective ways of dealing with a cast this big, especially with some of the people like Pat Moore or Mosley who've been there for a while. That's what you want, I think, out of a movie. And I think that's part, one of the reasons why this movie maybe was more satisfying than the last one is because it gave those characters some closure that you may not have gotten before. Mm -hmm. And the gay footman, why am I suddenly blanking on his name? Barrows. And he gets, uh, you know, he gets acknowledged and he gets to have an actor from the wire, you know, to love him or whatever. Dominic West, he gets to have like a moment with Dominic West. Dominic West is awesome, you know, so good for him. And he got even less screen time than the rest. I shared with you guys an article that was particularly scathing about that, that it was so important. His struggles as a gay man persecuted in this era were so central to some of the past storylines and how he was like the main villain, or at least one of the two, you know, at the beginning of the show. And as they became to understand each other better, you know, he became a nicer guy, but that there should have been a little more <laughs> or more than just like, Hey, uh, I'm just smiling at you. Why don't you just leave this place and come join me? Hoo hoo ha. Like, like it could have actually been one scene. It was actually spread over what, four scenes or something, but there was no more content in it than what I just said. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, It seemed to happen rather quickly and in a rather presumptuous way, almost that that character of Dominic West guy, I think his name was, made that presumption about Barrow. And then I guess Barrow didn't correct him. So perhaps that was his clue. But yes, it seemed to move rather quickly and a bit superficially. Well, to quote Thomas from one of the earlier episodes, you have to read the signs the best you can. So I guess that's what he was doing. But yeah, I think they could have sacrificed other screen time, perhaps, and given him a little more to develop that, especially if uh, spoiler alert here, if they're sending him off, I mean, that's, you know, perhaps there's another movie development yeah. from there. Who knows? It's almost like a greatest hits version of the show. It's in keeping to me of the soap opera ish, fanciful fiction, fairy tale ish nature of the show. I feel like originally the show was grounded in some sense of reality, but it became more fantastical as it went along. And by now we just accept the fact that it's cute and fairy tale-ish and we still love it anyway, you know, and you're not getting a, like a lot of substance out of it. You're getting kind of a good time entertainment out of it. I think that's a good transition to just talk about the revolutionary aspect of it, that just the fact that it is divided by class is something that just screams at us as modern people, certainly as Americans. I read that Julian Fells is a monarchist. Clearly, as I said, trying to make us care about the survival of this way of life he has some sympathy for small C conservatism, but they at least play with the idea that, you know, at various characters at various times will say, no, this is fundamentally messed up, but it's never resolved in a way that maybe some of them make human sense, sort of how the Alan Leach character, Tom Branson, how he starts out as a chauffeur and then he's put into position of power and he has to adjust to this. Like that's an interesting journey that he goes on. But is the message, as one of the articles I was looking at, just that, well, he was being young and naive, and that was before the actual Russian Revolution. And once that happened, then he got to see that, oh, maybe we servants shouldn't be so uppity. We should just be, as long as everybody's being compassionate to each other. In fact, I think I recall somewhere where one of the rich people was like, oh, yeah, I think it's Matthew, because he, he's like, I don't need somebody to dress me. 
I don't need service. Like, this is absurd. This, you know, he's standing in for a modern person and it is seen as insulting to the servants that like, this is my job. This is my livelihood. This is my dignity. You better let me do this. Everybody can get dignity in their place. Something like that. Absolutely. Both Corinne and I joke about this quite a bit is the opening scene of Lord Grantham walking down the staircase in the first episode. It just kind of sets the tone of there's that everybody knows their place type of theme to the uh, series as from Mosley being that frustrated butler with Matthew Crawley. At one point, Mosley even said, I'm having my career in reverse. Uh, Yeah, there's definitely some pride. I guess we all kind of can relate to that a little bit. You want to have a little pride in what you do. And I guess it's no different for the servants. And I think that Alan Leach's character, Tom, when he had gone to the States for a bit, and then he came back during the series, and he was describing how it's possible in one generation to go from somebody with nothing to a self-made man who's made everything, and you can do it in one generation. And the character he was speaking to, it may have been Lady Mary, if my memory serves, was remarking about how, well, that's still not going to happen here, but interesting how it happens over in America or something to that effect. So I thought that was an interesting contrast that Tom was kind of learning and opening his eyes to, wow, there really is more. And then for Julian Fellows to, to write that his character actually does go on to kind of break that class structure and that class barrier and, and elevate. He keeps marrying up throughout the, the course of the whole Downton Abbey arc. But I thought that that was kind of an interesting commentary on the time that in America, you could do what you want. And maybe that's the fascination that Americans have with this is that the class system that's so rigid, and I believe in many ways still exists overseas, is really such a foreign concept to us here in the States. Because while there definitely is the one percenters and the upper class and the middle class, lower class, whatever, it's not quite so, I think, defined as it is across the pond, if you will. The amount of pride that the downstairs crew, the servant crew took in their work and everything seems so foreign to an American, but it's so real to them. I was reminded of, and I may get this completely wrong. That movie, Life is Beautiful with Roberto Benigni, Mm -hmm. the Italian movie. I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theater, but there was a line in there. If I remember, someone's going to tell me I got this completely wrong, but the way I've always remembered it is he's a waiter in a restaurant And I think he's training somebody to become a waiter. And that person has kind of a bad attitude. Says, I'm no servant. And Roberto Benigni's character says something to the effect of, you're not a servant, you serve. God serves, he is not a servant. And the nobility that people who have a penchant for or an attention to servitude, the way that they have it, don't see it as being lesser than. They take great pride in doing the work that they do so well that it elevates them because in their eyes, they see themselves, it's a godly servitude, not servantude. And there's a difference there. I don't know that Americans who aren't wrapped up in the class system necessarily sees it that way. I think Mr. Carson is a great example of that. As the That's exactly who I was thinking of. Yes. Yes. And when people break that, at least often they are the villains, right? I should be able to shoplift. Because, or, you know, steal from the house because this is a fundamentally corrupt system. And even though that sounds like an argument, you're not supposed to sympathize with the thief in that case and say, yeah, you're right. This is absolutely absurd, which is what if you sort of remove yourself slightly from enjoying this as a TV show and actually think about living this is definitely, as you say, I guess it comes across as fantasy even though it's historical fiction, right? Because we're sort of putting our, not our whole morality. I mean, you know, so much of the appeal is appealing to moral sentiments, but at least putting that part of it on hold, trying to put yourself in the shoes of this foreign society. I think we see a good example of that with uh, Mr. Carson when his old pal Charlie shows up early in the, it was at the first season, I, I think it was, that shows up and they're talking about what was it the uh, being the, on the halls the, together the, yeah being on the halls together the uh, what was the name of the group the, oh, the cheerful charlies cheerful charlies that's right the cheerful charlies and how he was just so humiliated in front of lord grantham mm-hmm. that he should be found out that he had that previous existence and he was not who he is today and it's just you could tell the pride of how far he had come in life so or at least for what he considered you know, it's another one of those examples of that pride that they have. Speaking of movies I haven't seen since I saw them in the theater, Gosford Park, which was written by Julian, 
as well covers similar territory. And when I think about that movie, if I remember correctly, that movie felt more like an us versus them, kind of like, here's everything that happens above ground. But when you go underground, there's a seedy underbelly to this whole aristocratic thing. And it's these servants and they're, they're not as posh as they come off when they get above ground. But this show doesn't, I don't think, quite paint them that same way, even though it's written by the same guy who must be kind of like the guy who does the crown and the queen, Peter, whatever his name is, Peter Morgan, I think is his name. These guys must just be so obsessed with class and upstairs, downstairs that they want to just keep mining the same territory over and over again. They find so many stories there. Well, it's funny how convincing this is in terms of separating the cast in your mind such that in the new movie, and for some reason, I don't, I haven't felt that there's something that happens at the end that I don't want to spoil. Although probably you could figure it out. Elderly characters, what would happen to an elderly character in the new movie? Anyway, but I don't know. It seems like it's okay to spoil little things here. And with that buildup, I've forgotten what thing I was going to refer to. <laughs> so it's <that's> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to put my two cents in for this second film, the first film, I know that the hook was, okay, the king and queen are coming to stay on their tour of Yorkshire or whatever. But that didn't seem to have nearly as much of a grip on me as the potential secret that was woven in the storyline throughout the second film. And I think it was that not knowing, waiting along with the character that the secret may have been about and trying to figure out, well, is this true? Is this not true? To me, that's what really kind of kept me engrossed throughout this film. Yes, it sort of calls the whole, are these royals actually even royal into question, which would really screw with your head if this has been the premise of the entire thing and certainly is affecting the characters in this way. Near the end of this film, all the servants get to dress as nobles for the screen. And that is so bizarre to them and to you, the audience, because it's hard even though it's it's like when you see behind the scenes Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy is just joking around with Harry and you realize these are all just kids and they're friends. That's what this cast is. It's just a bunch of actors who are in themselves the same. I don't know if they're all the same. Maggie Smith is definitely a, a class above some of the other people, but the material wealth of the character has nothing to do with like the quality of the actor or anything. But yet they're so maybe because of the accents that it's different than if, if you had a purely American thing and it was everybody sort of talked the same, but it's so pronounced in England and they make a, you know, a big deal about this in this one with an actress character that is a, known for the silent movies and she actually can't do the posh accent. That's a, a significant plot point in this one. So yeah, just the fact that it is so trippy when it's, you see all these servant characters in their posh gowns. And I almost feel like, wait, am I a classist now? Why is this so trippy for me? It's just the show has been so successful in setting these characters up as as being who they are, I guess. It was very odd to see Mrs. Patmore or Mrs. Hughes dressed in a fine gown with their hair all done up and, and makeup and everything else. It, it was a little jarring. I think you're right, Mark. But it was so satisfying to see them and get that moment, you know, or those characters anyway, to get that moment, which seems like a weird thing to be considered a win. Talk about low stakes. You know, some servants in a mansion in a castle get to dress up nice once and be in a movie. That's what it's all about. Speaking of movies, I want to ask you guys, I'm curious what you think about these last two movies versus having another season of the show or something like that. My personal opinion is that the show itself sort of really started to run out of steam there near the end and that the movies are kind of nice two hour snacks or morsels of, you know, revisiting a group of people that made me happy for a while every few years and satiates me and then I'm fine to go on with my life. But would you guys prefer to have this be worked out into more seasons of the show continuing 10 episodes every week? I think I'd prefer to see more episodes. Really? Movie. The movies are nice and they're fun. I feel like they could do more with the episodes and it allows us to perhaps become be drawn in a little bit more and allow us to enjoy it and have a little bit more too at the same time. But I get everybody's shooting schedules and everything else that that probably isn't possible, but Hey, I'd watch it. The secret sauce seems to be that new historical events come along. They can jump forward a year. World war two is going to come up sometime in here. 
if they last long enough, if they do another movie or something or reprise the season, maybe have the parents are dead and base it on, you know, make it the Lady Mary show. Like I would be okay with that. Maybe even starting up a new show five, 10 years from now after a couple more just like very spaced out movies. And there might be enough to explore there. And it would just be kind of a different show. But like I said, with the Gilded Age, there are stories to tell in this style about any time period in any place. So like even with ER, with later seasons, it's like, you know, we haven't explored the NICU where they have like little preemie babies. So let's do a whole thing over there. Like as long as you're finding new stuff to explore and it isn't, as you said, John, you know, <laughs> Lady Mary's latest lover, like if they could just get past, just move on, get new characters in there, just keep cranking it. And then it, I think what makes a soap opera bad is the recycling, the recycle. And if you feel like the show is going to do that, then it is just a soap opera and nothing else and not actually historical fiction, which is what is valuable about it to me. Well, I'm really hoping that there's no evil twin that's going to come up out of nowhere in Downton Abbey. <laughs> but I can um, see it. You can see it? Yeah. <laughs> Which character? Do you know who you'd like to see? I just, I wouldn't put it past Julian Fellows to try that. <laughs> Why not? Well, we almost got a stepbrother that was unknown to this point. You could always have family secrets and things coming to light that allows you to introduce a lot of weird stuff. Well, and in this second movie, I think that was something that Michael and I were talking about even as we walked out of the theater. Were the kids, the, I guess, third or fourth generation, however you want to look at it, little Sibby and Miss Marigold and George, were those the same actors that they had used? Had there been enough time in real life for those kids? Were they older than they should have been in the time period in the movie? But that would be, I think, another vehicle for Julian Fellows to examine those kids then working their way up through and into World War II. Because at that yeah. point, George would probably be old enough to to serve, I would imagine, uh, maybe as, a, as an officer or something. So that might be another avenue if this is to proceed. Maybe there's some better call Sibby potential there somewhere, <laughs> you know, give it a spinoff. Was it part of every intro to Everybody Loves Raymond where like, this is about a guy and his wife and they have kids, but the show's not about the kids. Like it's not going to be you know, throughout, even though there were children here, they were so flavorless. Like I just would never care if they replaced the actors 10 times. Like they just made so little effect on me. Maybe I'm just forgetting some particular things, but it seems like if you're going to have a soap opera and you're going to have kids on it all the time, can one of the kids have like a significant problem such that resolving it is a thing? <laughs> Well, that's why I think what Corinne's saying is kind of interesting. If you read jumpstarted the show, but took it from the perspective of the kids, well, I mean, where did this movie lead off? Probably 1920 something or other. Well, when the Titanic crashed. So whenever that happened. Oh, oh this movie. Yeah, the movie. So <laughs> when it, whenever <laughs> talkies start coming in, I can't remember. But anyway, if they were, if the next round, like the crown goes through different chapters in history, if the next down Abbey was the children's new era, and you see them coming up during civil rights or rock and roll, pop culture, wars, Vietnam, all that kind of stuff. That might be kind of interesting to see how an aristocratic family that's trying to keep it together deals with that kind of stuff. We saw a little bit of that sort of in Mad Men, not aristocratic families. but Sure, but going into the 70s, yeah. Speaking of uh, spinoffs and such things like that, have you guys ever Googled or went on YouTube and found the Downton Abbey Star Wars clips? No. <laughs> oh, I believe it was the actor who played Thomas put this together, but they're running around with lightsabers and it's crazy. Just if you look for Downton Abbey Wars or Downton Abbey Star Wars, you'll find it. It is making me want to see what thing like Downton Abbey was Alec Guinness in at the time. Or was he? I guess there's no <laughs> prestige TV, so there would have to be a film. Maggie Smith with the lightsaber is impressive. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yes, this has got me a little fascinated of like finding young Maggie Smith in various things, you know, since we only know her. She's only become a, a superstar as a very, very old woman, you know, in Harry Potter, etc. Wasn't she in Clash of the Titans? I think she, she's been I, around forever. She ever. has yeah. Oscars and she's been around since like the 50s, 60s. Yes, I saw Evil Under the Sun, the Agatha Christie movie that she was in, as already, you know, in her, in middle age, 1981 or whatever. I mean, this is no disrespect to her, but I think she's looked like an aristocratic older <laughs> lady since she was probably 20. 
kind of like <laughs> Angela Lansbury. You know how Angela Lansbury has looked like an older, upstanding woman since she was probably 18? I think Maggie Smith's kind of similar. I might have looked that up like, oh, yeah, when she started Murder, she wrote she was 40 or something like that. Like, what? What? Yeah, I think she was in her 50s or something like that. We were just all kids. We can't, We had no perspective. That's right. <laughs> um, 50 back then is not what 50 is today. No. Does your enjoyment of this show carry over to anything else? Or is this, you know, apart from, again, the Gilded Age, which might just be the same show in a different location. To me, it is Julian Fellow's writing. And so... This doesn't make me want to like go track down other period pieces of this type or seem so different. None of you have seen Bridgerton, but like it is such a, I want to say dumpster fire, but a lot of people really like it, but it is much more self-consciously trashy and fun, let's say, to put it nicely, as compared to this, which, you know, maintains the veneer of this is masterpiece theater. I guess I did watch Poldark based on this, that, oh, well, that was another Masterpiece Theater thing that was showing in between seasons of this. And even though that was a different historical period, it had enough in common with this that like, okay, I think this is a formula that any number of people could do. And I might be on board for much more of this. I just, I think Julian Fellows, his writing is masterful. And I've enjoyed, I think, everything I've I've seen of his. In fact, I was first introduced to Julian Fellows when Michael introduced me to the the old British TV show, old from probably the 90s, uh, Monarch of the Glen. And he was an actor in that. And that early 2000s. Is that when it was? Yeah. Early 2000s? I thought he was just an actor. I didn't realize he was such a prolific writer and probably already had quite the, the writing career before that. But whatever he writes from now on, I probably will. We'll see. Just because I enjoy his style. And I think the way that he nuances his characters is just very well done. What about you, Michael? I would definitely watch anything that Julian Fellows puts out there, probably. I mean, because I'm very curious about his work, but I would definitely welcome more of the Downton, of course, and more of the uh, the Gilded. Like Corinne was staying there, I, I love the Monarch of the Glen. And while I don't believe he was the writer of that series, but I think it'd be amazing if he did something like that. But it is an interest in his work, not of this as a formula for making a show. I guess I'm surprised there haven't been more copies. Maybe there have been, and I just haven't been aware of them. But like, given how successful this was, you'd think that we'd have, you know, just like Game of Thrones has produced a lot of things that are trying to be Game of Thrones or Lost produced all those different Losts. I'm surprised maybe this was too established a genre for people to say, ooh, we've hit on something new and exciting. Let's rip this off a thousand times. Well, isn't this kind of a ripoff. I mean, wasn't the old Masterpiece Theater PBS Upstairs Downstairs from the 1970s or perhaps even the 80s? That was a huge hit from what I recall that adults of the day were were hooked on that probably much as adults now are, are hooked on Downton Abbey. But it's still the same theme, just like Gosford Park was the, the upstairs versus the downstairs goings on. Again, no offense to Downton Abbey, but I didn't think the concept was particularly fresh. It was just sort of an enjoyable, entertaining spin on this particular situation. I feel like the Brits mine their own history almost in real time. They are like the masters of period pieces and historical fiction and whatever the little slight corner of history they can find, they're going to make a masterpiece theater miniseries out of it. That's just what they do and costume dramas and all that kind of stuff. They've been mining it in real time. I don't know that I care enough about Julian Fellow's like if this went back to being a series on TV, I doubt I would rededicate myself to it. It feels in a lot of ways to me, a lot of them feel like work. They feel like too much work. They're, especially this show, again, as I was saying, as the seasons went on, my wife and I stayed committed because we had invested already in the first couple of seasons. But eventually we're both on our phones and these shows take 50 to 55 minutes and there's no commercials. And we're both kind of, oh, we got to catch up. Let's catch up on some Down to Abbey tonight. You know, it eventually got to that. And it's not because I didn't like it, but I was just sort of, it's a little exhausting to me. But every now and then, because I love British culture and British music, I get a craving for British entertainment, kind of like I get a craving for ice cream. It's an itch. I got a scratch. And so what's out there for me to watch? And it might be Game of Thrones. It might be Catastrophe. It might be The Office. It might be anything. It might be Broadchurch, which is one of the best miniseries I've ever seen. 
so there's there's lots of options out there. They're great at doing this kind of stuff. And maybe the reason there's not more Downton is because there's actually already scores of options for you to pick up and watch anytime you want on some streaming service. I think I would be more interested in other history that I hadn't thought of this beforehand, but I watched most of the show The Great about Catherine the Great, which is a much more comic you know, and dark show than this. Most of the characters are, are just loathsome in there, but there's enough picture of like what the historical, what the political situation was at the time that it's still interesting on those grounds as well as, you know, is it a well-written, interesting show? Having the connection to the history. So again, pole dark that is set in, like you hear a lot about the revolutionary war in America, but what about the British who are coming home from the revolutionary war? What was it like for them there? Like, okay, that's a story that I've never actually heard before. So that was interesting to me. So I think I'd be more impressed with a, like a Downton Abbey in France. Like, even if I'm reading subtitles, that's fine. I'm a grown up. I can do that. <laughs> People are getting used to. I just watched a whole freaking that stupid heist show in Spanish for hour after hour. I think that, you know, these things can actually be popular if they're in a foreign language. So yes, let's mine other parts of history rather than necessarily just becoming fans of, I gotta, I gotta feel British today. I don't feel that enough that I've say gotten into the queen, though I might at some point. I get the feeling of Downton Abbey is that uh, chicken soup for the soul type of of feeling, you know? If we can't uh, figure out what else we'd like to watch, we'll say, how about some Downton? And I can't tell you how many times we've watched the series over and over again, or we'll just say, well, which, which episode should we do this time? And I tend to say, there's so much on all these different streaming services that we could watch. And yet it is kind of chicken soup for the soul. It, it's not necessarily mind numbing, but it just, it's a feel good kind of thing. I think that what defines that kind of show to me is, are the bad guys just misunderstood? And they gain some spiritual insight eventually. And now they're good again. And so that had, that happened with some of them on the show, but some of them were just bad and they got kicked off the show. (laughs) And so, or murdered in the case of one important character. It struck me as a little more. I don't think in a pure chicken soup for the soul thing, you would have a what season long arc of a main character being in prison (laughs) wrongly. Like that's a bit much. (laughs) But maybe that's why people slagged on that. They're like, this is not serving the purpose I showed up for. I don't want something this realistic and grim. I want to feel good more quickly. Well, there had to be some sort of a mechanism to have some tension and some drama and something, some place for the characters to go. And I think as for the, I don't know if you call it a spiritual redemption of Thomas Barrow, um, he definitely mellowed over the years. But I thought that was an interesting character arc for him to explore as an actor, to go from more evil in the beginning and vicious and vile. And and he kept that up for quite a few seasons, but then I think through the movies as well for him to mellow a bit and perhaps understand that in order to be accepted by his peers, whether he was gay or not, just as a, as a human being to not be so, you know, vicious. Um, I thought hopefully it was something that was interesting for him to, to explore as an actor. Well, thanks all for coming on here. Any last thoughts? Should we make a sales pitch? <laughs> I don't know if anybody would have sat through this whole episode if they have no familiarity with the show whatsoever. I feel that about the movies. If you were not a Downton Abbey fan, do you think that you would go just see this new movie by yourself? Or not necessarily by yourself, but would you just, as a standalone thing, do you think that it has enough appeal to do that? That would be weird. I I agree. It would be a little weird. You you need some backstory with this, I think. So that might say something about So when a show sticks around long enough, then you start like, hey, let's have the characters do musical numbers. Like you start playing with them in a way that is just shamefully pandering to the people that really like those characters. And so even the whole thing in this movie of let's have Lady Mary sort of be an actress and do these voiceovers and do them on her first take amazingly, like, no, that is not the way that it would work. This is just taking advantage of the actress having a wonderful voice. I don't buy this as a a standalone thing whatsoever. Yes. I think this is almost purely a fan service activity. Yeah. I would agree. (laughs) Especially this one. I mean, not very much in this movie moved anyone's story progressively along in a way that had to be done. But like the McLeods were saying earlier, I thought they came up with really fun, interesting environments to put these people, Hollywood. It was interesting to watch, Carson 
serve out in the hot summer sun and deal with being sweaty. And I thought, I'd never thought of that before, but you're right. These people have to wear these get-ups in 100-degree heat in a British summer and serve people and sweat into their food and everything. Just little, little tiny angles like that that you don't think about, but something different. I appreciated that. It's a new shade of color that wasn't on there before. Thanks, folks, for listening. Thanks, John. Good to talk to you again about something that's not music. Anytime. McClouds, Corinne, I've been looking to have you on here for a while. I've been looking forward to being part of this podcast uh, for a long time. And Michael, I, I was greatly anticipating your appearance for our 20 whole minutes. <laughs> Thanks so much for filling in. It was, a, it was a treat to hear the audience can't see you guys look at each other to check on your answers. Is that what you like too? Huh? Is that what you... <laughs> Quite adorable. It's interesting to me that we have three dudes and one girl talking about Downton Abbey. I love it. You would think it would be the other way around. I asked my This Is Us panel, and many of the other women had, and they had not, did not have... In fact, I had multiple people say, oh yeah, I watched until they killed off Matthew. And then I was like, screw this show. <laughs> <laughs> so many people were mad about that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. So long, folks. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet you guys. You Thanks too, John. Mark. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, See you all later. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.